The documentary you are about to experience includes mature and disturbing subject matter and may not be appropriate for some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. We call it genocide because of what happened to us when we were babies. As children, that's what we did. We disappeared. We left. We left our bodies. We, we, we lived in our minds. We thought about our families, our brothers, our sisters, our grandmothers back home, stuff like that. That's where we were. That's how I made it. That's how I survived. I tell kids that we do live in one of the best countries in the world, but it hasn't always been the best for First Nations people. There's memories that I have in that structure, that foundation out there beside the bell. The First Nations people, kids lived on the end of this thing, right from the moment they woke up until the last moment before they went to bed. As we got older, you got the physical abuse and then you got the sexual abuse. Sexual abuse probably started the day you entered into that residential school system till the day you graduated out of it. These three gentlemen have uh, changed my thinking and my lens in which I view the world. I, I was struck with what they had said and the strength at which they shared their stories. We are now moving towards reconciliation, true reconciliation and mission today. This is actually what I find is the most compelling to talk about. A lot of people are aware of these now, residential schools, the effect that it has. I realize that this is why I had my job now as a youth care worker. The impact of this is intergenerational. I had a life from being born to maybe seven years old when I was taken away from my mom and dad. That was basically the only love that I remember in my life. And then when I was taken away, it was the beginning of hell. I'm telling you, it was hell. Because down in this old school underneath the grotto here, it was pure discipline, like Brother Joe says, with the strap. We lived with the strap the moment we opened our eyes in the morning until we went back to the same bed. And then you would go into nightmares about what you seen during that day. I remember kids getting wailed on because they went to bed. So the guy that was supposed to be looking after us, he was an ugly brother. He used to come out of his room, shaking the bell, waking everybody up, and swinging this back and forth. We had probably 150 boys up on the top dormitory, and he'd go up and down the aisle of every row of beds and throwing blankets back finding kids that went to bed. And when he did find them, they did 25 of these on the hands every morning. It became routine for many of them. That was the kind of ugliness that we learned as a child. Children, to grow up like this, was seriously uncalled for by our people. My uh, residential school experience started as a six-year-old. I was six years old, gone on seven. And uh, all my brothers and sisters, nieces, nephews, all of my cousins, they all went. Mothers, fathers, you name it, we were all splashed by the same blood. I read a caption somewhere last week that says, uh, residential school well, the gift that keeps on giving and that's true you've heard so many stories that uh, 
kind of validate that. Got a lot of stories in my, in my family. And we struggle with uh, pain. We, we struggle without the skills to, to be healthy and happy. The worst part of these schools, and a lot of teachers are uncomfortable talking about this, the worst part of these schools is that the boys' dormitory was on one side of the campus and the girls were on the other side. Two nuns watched the girls' dormitory overnight and one priest watched the boys. My dad said the worst part of this was that no one watched what the priest was doing and at night he'd go into the aisles of beds in the boys' dormitory, remove a child, bring him to a separate room in the school and sexually abuse them. Graphic. And my dad, when this first happened, he was six years old. And the first thing most kids do is they get scared and they cry. My dad did that. But you can only cry for so long. What he did next, he tried to run away. Well, it worked. He ran away. He snuck out at night, made it all the way back home. But when he got home, there was an Indian agent waiting at his house. What happens is the government hires someone called an Indian agent to work on the reserve, and those are the people who bring the children to the schools. And if some child runs away from the school, the principal of the residential school calls the reserve, the band office talks to an Indian agent, and the Indian agent then brings the child back to the school. And if they can't find the child, they call the police. Eventually, they would find you if you ran away. So my dad was brought back to the school, even after trying to run away. And as he got older, the abuse got, got worse. And he started to get angry, really angry. He actually tried to burn the school down. <laughs> A lot of kids tried to burn the school down. He fought. But when they rebuilt the school, and he kept getting punished for his fights, he started to just shut down. He started to give up. And he didn't kill himself, but he did the one thing just short of that. He put this little bubble around him, this imaginary bubble where he'd just sit inside, and he'd be angry, and he'd hate, and he'd fight. And if anybody came into that little bubble, he'd hit them really hard. The way he was taught was when someone's a problem, the way to solve it, you hit it as hard as you can. And my parents, they had no choice because they would tell my mom and dad, we had 14 in our family, and the Indian agent would come to our house and tell us, tell my mom and dad, if you do not let us take your children away from you, to go to Indian residential school, you too are going to jail. When this residential school started at the bottom of the hill is where our people, the Stolo Nation used to live by the river. It was just a stopover from people traveling up and down the Fraser River by canoe, going down shopping or going down to trade and then the Catholic system came in and took over. My grandmother was one of the first ones that went to Christine's residential school. The uh, physical plant had a lot to be desired. There's nothing like this building. Uh, there wasn't a drop of insulation in the place. Central heating was mediocre. Uh, hot water, sometimes you saw it twice a week. Food was terrible. The food you got it's mush in the morning, piece of bread and a piece of jam, and that kept you till lunchtime or dinner time. Lunchtime and dinner time, you were served uh, usually green bologna, green hot dogs, mustard, spam. Maybe you got spam. Spam didn't go bad because it was in a can, but you got to like mustard real quick. So your diet at best was something to keep you alive. 
I remember as a child, that stuff smelled bad, tasted bad. Take you a couple of days, but after a while you ate it. You knew you had to eat it, because you were gonna die of starvation. You were dying of pain, you were dying. You were dying of loneliness, isolation. You had nothing, you had no medical. You were given maybe an aspirin if you had a headache. Anybody got sick? Everybody got sick in that whole dorm. And there was one nun, and she was our infirmary, and she just basically patched us up, gave us a Band-Aid, and told us not to kill ourselves. And that was the extent of our medical. So medical, food, mediocre at best. Every morning we had to get up and go down into the shower and over there in that foundation, the shower all the way down in the bottom in the basement. And before you get into the shower, you have to step into a trough. <coughs> it was about two feet by two feet. And that white, it had a white solution in there. I don't know what it was called, but it was supposed to be a remedy to clean, clear athletes, but which was rampant in the boys' laboratory. And you can hear the kids just stepping in there, and then they get pushed over and get into the shower. Well, I got in there, and I went into the shower, and here comes the nun. She's walking down our stairs into the boys' shower, and she was checking us, making sure we were clean in the ears, behind the ears, the neck, the body. And then it was my turn to come out of the shower and go and be attacked by her. She started attacking my body and my neck and my ears. And she had a little, little bristle brush like this. And that was really, really hard. Bristles on it. And she started to scrub me. She called me a dirty little Indian. Because of the color of my skin. And she started scrubbing, scrubbing and scrubbing my neck. All around. And I was hurting and I was crying and I got pushed back into the shower to wash it all off. And I got clean and I started to walk back up the stairs and I thought it was water. The discipline that was administered to us was uh, administered to us by nuns, priests, brothers of the Catholic uh, oblates. And they didn't hesitate to kick you, slap you, or verbally abuse you. That was, that's the way they taught. That was their thing. They, they beat you in line, they kicked you in line, they ridiculed you, you felt bad. By the time they were done with you, you weren't sure about yourself. By the time the fifth and sixth grade rolled around, you had a thousand yard stare, you got your head slapped around more than once, you got straps. Um, the straps that you got were administered by a grown man and he took the strap and he just laid into you till you cried. You saw kid after kid cry like that. Your brothers, your cousins, your first cousins, everybody got it. Nobody was exempt. So by the time you got into the fifth or sixth grade, you knew how to get in line real quickly. You didn't have much to say, quiet. You didn't start fights. Because if you did, you'd, you'd lose what little privileges you had. You didn't have much for privileges. Maybe you got to see a movie once a week and you might lose that. So the uh, discipline and the education were extreme. So a lot of us <clears throat> that went to these residential schools have a kind of a 
callous spot in our heart for an education system because we know maybe we learned to read and write but we knew what accompanied that we knew we lost our culture we lost our self-esteem and sometimes in a lot of cases we lost our manhood our childhood that's what they call discipline taking the devil out of the evening they call it horrible horrifying nightmares but i still have a lot of anger and a lot of hate for the church and for the government. The reason why I hate is because I have seven sisters. Three of them were sexually abused by priests. And I've just learned that in the last maybe five years that they finally stepped up and said that they were abused by priests. That creates hate and anger, pure anger in my body, my heart. What happened to my sisters? They were the most beautiful people that I know, and I didn't even know they got it worse than I did. My dad uh, didn't have his dad either, because when my dad was two, his dad died in the war. And my grandma, she was an alcoholic and a single mom. She couldn't cope, so she ran, and she left Donald with her sister. So my dad didn't actually have a family, a mother and a dad to come back to. And then at 14 years old, he started to drink a lot. He started to fight all the time. He was in juvenile detention centers. The cops knew him well, and then, years later, with a lot of anger inside of him, when he was 25 years old, he went to a bar. Him and his friend went to a bar to watch a hockey game, and his friend had a girlfriend. So there was three of them that went to the bar, and this one guy comes up and starts hitting on the girl. Well, my dad and his friend, they didn't like that, so what they do? Well, when someone's a problem, you hit it as hard as you can. They beat him up really bad, like with stools and stuff. It was bloody and messy, but the guy got away. He ran out the door, and on his way back, he shouted at them. He said, this isn't over. He got in his car, and he drove away. And my dad and his friend, they knew where he lived, so they got to his house. They chased in their car. They got to his house, and the door was open, and he answered with a rifle in his hand. Months later, the judge says to my dad, did you do it? If you admit to this, I'll go lighter on your sentencing. My dad said, your honor, I blanked out drunk. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. The judge says to my dad's friend, did you do it? If you admit to this, I'll go lighter on your sentencing. My dad's friend said, your honor, I blanked out drunk. It wasn't me. I couldn't have done it. It must have been him. So the judge said, you know what? I don't really care. I'm just gonna put both of you in jail for the same crime. You'll both go to jail for second degree murder because one of you got the gun from that man and blew his head off. So that anger inside my dad, he finally killed somebody. And the reason I do this is to uh, share with you what's an intergenerational effect of these schools. There's a lot of kids in our schools who have family homes, family lives like this, raised with people who've gone through a lot. And if I'd have stayed with that dad, if he'd have raised me, he probably would have passed down a lot of those lessons he learned when he was a kid and the abuse. That's the intergenerational effect. The words that I've seen beaten on a child in this place was just totally unbearable. And then many of us, right from grade one, probably to grade 12, 
we always probably used to think, where is our help? For years and generations, we always wished, where are our cops? Who can we trust? Who can we tell what's happening to us? Inside of me, inside of my head, inside of my heart is a disaster that never will go away. The shame, the hurt, the anger, the disgust, because I was sexually abused time and time and time again in residential school. Alcoholism, nightmare demon shadows, lack of leadership, loss of being a professional soccer player, destruction of marriage, personal relationships with women, employment downfalls, physical pain and suffering. The imaginary dirt, slime, hatred, shame and anger on my body can never be washed away, no matter how many times I bathe, I bathe or shower every day. The fear of sharing this filth with people I love. I could never hug my mother or sister anymore for years. I didn't want to dirty them with my disgust. I could not show affection to women that I care for for fear of them knowing my personal shame and disgust. That never ever dissolves. It's horrifying. But since um, I got married and I have five sons, three grandbabies, which I'm dearly in love with, it was kind of a beginning of a love structure that finally is building me up back to be a man and a human being. It was like 10 years ago I came back and during, during that time, I always did piecemeal uh, bandages on myself to keep myself together, to be socially acceptable, to be legal. For, and uh, those things that I did were, uh, one of the things I started to do was uh, group and uh, therapist. Uh, those were diff that was a difficult thing for me to do. I never saw any value to be able to get up and speak and hopefully be a better human being. In the last few minutes, my heart has been just pounding and pounding because of the, the horrible feelings that I get when I come back here. I've only been here maybe four times in the last 50 years. But I'm, I'm trying to look at it as a healing. So I, my body that went through the disaster of being here. Um, he was quite an athlete and he would often run. He'd go from the boys dormitory and run along here, run up the road, come out here and go all the way out throughout um, this area and he'd do laps and he'd go down and he'd do laps because that was his way of kind of fighting through things was through physicality. Childhood education I think was lacking. I think I learned things that I didn't need to learn. So my heart goes out to real educators you know, as such as you are. People that are concerned and have a genuine care for children doesn't matter what color they are. We spend a lot of years and a lot of mo lonely nights and lo lonely moments at this place without our families. The families we did have were my brother Cyril, a couple other friends. You got a couple of good friends and you stuck with them. We, we were completely denied to speak our tongue. And I, I think the reason was because we were be becoming assimilated to what the church was trying to persuade us to be for many years. There were many elders that refused to give up the language and the cultures and traditions of the Longhouse. And by those elders, the rope is now mending back fully to become who we really once were full First Nations of this country and we're proud of it. <laughs>
and the young people are proud of what they do in their tongue, in their traditions, their culture. The drumming and the songs, it's beautiful. And we're not denied to be a part of society anymore. We're, we're actually a piece of the race. And we're starting to show them that we could be as good as anybody in this world that we want to be as in language or traditions and culture. And by golly, it's coming. And I'm very, very proud of my young people, of who they are and what they're going to be in their careers. They have pride and respect and honor for the rest of the world. Um, as I say, they're growing up to be somebody compared to how their elders were stereotyped and denied of everything that they've been learning. I went from grade one to grade six here and then seven to grade 12 in the new school. My last couple of years, I went down to Mission Senior Secondary which was really tough because it was like, it was really like an animal being let out of a cage. It was my first experience to be going to the education system with society. Um, the common experience then went to litigation, then uh, commemoration, and now you hear the, the word reconciliation, which is going to be... I, I have a really hard time with that definition because reconciliation has something that you're supposed to try and heal over something that happened to you. I will never go there. I will never go to reconciliation because of what they did to me. You hear me when I speak about being a professional in shame. It's true. Inside of me, inside of my head, inside of my heart is a disaster that never will go away. It was years, 10 years ago, I came back from the state of Washington and decided that I needed to uh, recon my, reconcile myself to the facts that happened to me in my past life so I could be here today, be happy, be healthy, and maybe get to see my grandkids grow up. Ten years ago, I didn't think I'd be, I, I would be able to say that and be here, but here I am. Anyway, this litigation took me to Donovan Company. It was a litigation that was the hardest part of this trip. First, I had to talk to all my friends, talk to counselors. I had to get all these legal papers together. I had to prove I even existed. I had to prove that these acts that happened to me, sexual, physical, the abuse, happened. And, and it took me three years from the day I started till a day I went to court with a adjudicator, two adjudicators from Government of Canada, a couple of lawyers, a room full of witnesses, and it took me eight hours. And by the time I was done with that thing, I, I felt sick, I wanted to puke, felt bad. And I wasn't just sick for that day, I was sick for a good part of a week. There's so much that, that can be told with regard to residential school, but the impacts that survivors are suffering since the court system, we had maybe 25 in our group that were sexually abused by the same pedophile. And in the end, this pedophile read his statement. And it wasn't only 18 men that he sexually abused. He said it was 40. So that really threw us off track on what we were winning. 
after the court system was over, he got three years in jail. He served one, then they let him go. And we started to wonder, why? Why in the hell did he only get three years? They said, because of his age. They let him go. The 40 victims he had were sentenced to life for what he's done to us. Hey, got a deal for you? We'd like you to tell our story again. And, but this time, we want you to tell our story to our therapists, our psychologists, our forensic psychologists. But I told them, no, this was it. Took me a lot to get here, tell my story. My kids are all grown to this day. It's my oldest daughter is the only one I've had any discussion with about residential school and stuff like this. And it's the only reason that's happened is because she's gone to therapy and she wanted to know, hey, what happened? My other two kids are still, at, not at that point. They said, Dad, can you tell us your story? They're not interested right now. But when it does happen, I'll tell them. And I spend a lot of time with my grandkids. Even them, I don't share. I don't tell them what happened to them. I tell them about my culture. I tell them about my grandma. But I never tell them about residential school, where I went. And I never told my children. And if anything, I did them a disservice, because I passed and trained the exam to them things that you know, maybe I didn't express enough uh, interest in my culture for obvious reasons. And I expected them to pick that up as they got older, but so far it's only worked for one of them. That's one out of three, and hopefully the other two will be forthcoming. I wrote a little bit here on reconciliation so it might give you an idea of, of what to deal with when you go back to your, your school. <clears throat> this word is a, is a battle for the survivors of our First Nations people. It does not belong in the education system right now. Our youth have done nothing wrong in this system. Our youth will strive together with all of their hearts to defeat wrong being done to them while being educated. You seniors, staff of the boards, principals, vice principals, teachers, support workers, and whoever in the education system are the protectors. Stay strong, your leadership, your leadership will not be penetrated by violators, predators, bullies. <coughs> they are our enemies. Your weapons are honor, respect, freedom, most of all love for your youth of kindergarten, elementary, high school, college, universities. Victory will be yours in the end, then we all have peace. There is a big drum, we call it. This drum has eight sticks for our heart, our heartbeat. The eight stick is the First Nations teacher. The other seven sticks belong to every continent in the world. What a vision and what a strong, what a song when that becomes accomplished and heard. It can be done, or the family tree, a tree of beautiful branches from all over the world, beautiful languages, beautiful cultures, beautiful traditions. It can be done and it belongs to you. Reconciliation wouldn't have a chance. Love it. I thank the Creator for the courage and strength during my battle. I thank Him for the determination to carry on with good spirit. I thank Him for the many survivors that I have stood with during the battle. When my day comes for life to be over on this Mother Earth, I will bow to freedom. I will bow to honor and respect. I will bow to a new journey. I will surrender to my judgment day and say thank you, Grandfather. I am ready for real justice then on to eternity. 
Today I thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen, with pride, and I thank you from the bottom of our hearts. I certainly hope we gave you a little bit of more knowledge and understanding today about residential school. I bow to you with love and respect. Thank you all for hearing my voice. There's something there that has to be taught to society with regard to what happened to our people all across Canada. And it's only fair that they know because of the wrong that was done to our people. There's an effect there that is, still exists, even in stereotype, to our people. And it, it's a correction that's going to be everlasting until probably the last survivor. When the last survivor is gone, then maybe it might be over. Mm -hmm.